the area of the blast damage from a four megaton explosion would be immense engulfing virtually all of downtown. While nuclear weapons and the existential questions they raise have been with us for nearly 80 years, some of the basic facts about nuclear weapons are really poorly understood. I am Dr. Jeffrey Lewis. I am a distinguished scholar of global security at Middlebury College. Every year I travel to Hiroshima. I try to confront the horror of what nuclear weapons do to human beings and ensure that that reality anchors my own thinking about nuclear weapons. From the beginning, our debates about nuclear weapons have been dominated by scientists because in the very beginning, scientists were the only ones who really understood the destructive power of nuclear weapons. And they were also the only people who really understood that physicists in other countries were going to be able to replicate the discoveries of the Manhattan Project. The question of why people are building nuclear weapons is worth dwelling on. It's not that the leaders building nuclear weapons are fools, although sometimes I do wonder. We are all worried about the fate of the world, but we also have to live our lives, and sometimes we worry about the wrong things. Coming to bed, honey? Yes, dear. The fate of the world is generally everybody's problem, which sometimes kind of makes it no one's problem in particular. What I'm hoping to do is to ask you to make this problem yours. And if you accept this call, there are probably some things you'll want to know. Nuclear weapons are enormously destructive. It is incredibly difficult to convey this idea and always has been. This is why the explosive force of a nuclear weapon is expressed in something called kilotons. The scientists out there might know that a joule is the better unit, but most people don't know that a joule is one newton applied over a distance of one meter. Most people don't know what a newton is. A kiloton is the explosive force of 1,000 tons of TNT. The original idea was to relate a nuclear explosion to something that a normal person might be able to understand. The problem, of course, is do you really know what a stack of 1,000 tons of TNT looks like? This is a stack of 500 tons of TNT, the largest ever assembled. It was 17 feet high, or a little more than five meters, about the height of a giraffe. 500 tons of TNT is also about the size of the explosion that devastated the city of Beirut in 2020. The video on the left is taken from a little over a mile away, while the video on the right is taken from about two thirds of a mile. The destruction in Beirut came from a shock wave, which produced what we call overpressure. We express the blast or the power of the shock wave in pounds per square inch or kilopascals. Here's an image of Beirut after the blast. In the immediate vicinity where the buildings were subjected to 20 PSI or higher, steel frame buildings are totally destroyed and concrete buildings are severely damaged, enough to not be repairable. Further away, where pressures exceeded 5 PSI, we can see the buildings are also largely destroyed. The steel buildings are destroyed while the concrete buildings are severely damaged. And across the highway where the blast is 1 PSI or more, windows are broken and buildings are damaged. This is an explosion of 500 tons of TNT, or half a kiloton. Nuclear weapons are much, much larger than this. There's a new movie out called A House of Dynamite, where Chicago is targeted with a nuclear weapon. So let's take a look at what would happen if a bomb were really dropped on the Windy City. Let's start with Fat Man, the nuclear weapon that the United States dropped on the Japanese city of Nagasaki in 1945. Fat Man exploded with a force of about 21 kilotons, 1,650 feet above the city, roughly the height of the Willis Tower in Chicago. The fireball from the explosion will be about 700 feet across and will reach temperatures in the tens of millions of degrees. It will incinerate the top part of the Willis Tower. The explosion will also leave a crater about 300 feet across, which is the size of the city block where the Willis Tower once stood. For about a mile, the blast will destroy most of the buildings. This is the area of the most intense damage. Buildings here will receive more than five pounds of pressure per square inch. Most of the residential buildings will collapse, injuries will be universal, and fatalities widespread. This is also the area where fires are most likely to start and spread. Inside this mile, 
everyone will receive very high doses of radiation. Hundreds of REMs. And REM is a Rengen equivalent man. A chest x-ray, for example, generally would expose a patient to about 0.01 REMs. So for many people, this will be a fatal dose. And of the survivors, about 15% will die of cancer. The area of the blast and radiation includes the Art Institute of Chicago, Greek Town, Trump Tower, and Grant Park, where Barack Obama celebrated his election in 2008. Within about a mile and a half of the explosion, extending almost to Soldier Field where the Chicago Bears play, anyone outside will suffer third degree burns all over their body. The explosion will be felt all through Chicago. Pressures up to one PSI will damage structures as far as three miles away. One PSI may sound small, but remember, that's the same force in the two videos you just saw from Beirut. There's a lot we don't know. Does the city burn again like Chicago did in 1871 or Hiroshima in 1945? Nagasaki didn't catch fire. We like to imagine that our cities today are more fireproof. But the 2017 Grenfell Tower Fire in London should teach us to be more humble about new materials in unusual environments. And then there is the fallout. It really depends on how close the bomb is to the ground when it explodes, and when it does, which way the wind is blowing. Even without accounting for fallout, we would expect around 200,000 fatalities and an equal number of serious injuries. For the approximately 200,000 people who will be seriously injured, Chicago only has 9,000 hospital beds. Three of Chicago's largest hospitals, Rush, Northwestern, and Insight, will have been seriously damaged in the explosion. These hospitals are inside the area that experienced both high radiation and moderate blast damage. It's almost certain that the hospital buildings will be severely damaged and the surviving doctors too injured to treat anyone. That's what happened at Nagasaki at any rate. Modern thermonuclear weapons are bigger. Existing US thermonuclear weapons range from 100 kilotons for the W76 to 1.2 megatons, that is more than 1 million tons of TNT for the B-83. The largest nuclear weapon that is currently deployed is a four megaton nuclear weapon for China's DF-5 ICBM. That's four million tons of explosive power. If the United States and China exchanged nuclear weapons, China would very likely target large urban areas like New York, Los Angeles, and Chicago with the DF-5. This time, the fireball is much, much larger, more than a mile in radius, engulfing virtually all of downtown. The area of the blast damage from a four megaton explosion would be immense. The area exposed to 20 pounds per square inch, enough to destroy virtually every building, extends for more than two miles, past Soldier Field, the Field Museum, and the United Center. Areas exposed to five PSI extend almost five miles past what used to be Comiskey Park in the south and all the way to Wrigley Field on the north side. Blast damage of one pound per square inch would extend more than 12 miles, almost as far as Chicago's O'Hare Airport in the northwest and the Indiana border in the southeast. The explosion would probably shatter glass at O'Hare and in Evanston, although the city might shield the areas behind it. Everyone exposed to the flash within a 14-mile radius would have third-degree burns. The destruction now encompasses the vast majority of Chicago's hospitals, which are badly damaged and with staff too hurt to treat anyone. The scale of this destruction is what makes nuclear weapons different. By comparison, Allied planes dropped only 3.4 million tons of bombs during the entirety of World War II. There are currently nine nuclear weapon states with almost 10,000 nuclear weapons. Apartheid-era South Africa built nuclear weapons in the 1980s, but gave them up in 1989. Iran doesn't have nuclear weapons, at least not yet. Our countries have made a Faustian bargain. Since we don't know how to resolve our differences without war, we've decided to make war so destructive that even a madman wouldn't start one. Our current plan is to hope that nuclear deterrence works forever and without fail. 
We know this isn't possible, that eventually time will run out. And so there have always been people who have been working to try to control the arms race. During the Cold War, both Washington and Moscow negotiated bilateral arms control agreements to reduce the risk of nuclear war. The United States and Russia still have the largest nuclear arsenals and are still the only two countries to try to limit those arsenals with arms control agreements. Russia, however, has suspended its compliance with the one arms control agreement that remains, the New START Treaty. When it expires in February, the US and Russia could be without a legally binding arms control agreement for the first time since the Nixon administration negotiated the SALT-1 interim agreement and the ABM Treaty in 1972. Once you understand the destruction that these terrible weapons can do, you understand how important it is that we find a way to control them.